today. Well, we're pleased to have Dr. Terry, Chris Terry, uh, with us. And Dr. Terry is the Associate Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Tennessee. And he's currently spending his sabbatical, or part of his sabbatical here at, him at Portland State. And so today we'll talk about new probe data sources for measuring site flight behavior and safety. Uh, with that, I will give the floor to Dr. Terry. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to inform uh, questions about cycling safety and, uh, and cycling health and e bikes and all these other things that are very important and emerging. Uh, and um, that's what I'll talk about today. Okay. Uh, I will get into uh, some of the motivation and other issues, but uh, how many in here use like a smartphone app to track your bike rides? Anybody? Okay. Uh, do you track every bike ride or do you just track uh, your uh, road bike rides or your recreational cycling or do you do every commute trip? Recre oh yeah, well I asked two questions with two answers. Who does, uh, who, do, who, who only uses it for recreation? Let's say that. Okay, just a couple of you. And then who uses it uh, for also their commute trips? Okay. Yeah, so, right. So Google's uh, got its own little universe, big universe, I guess, okay? Uh, so we'll talk about a lot of the, we'll talk about several of these initiatives that we're working on. Uh, at the University of Tennessee, we're also partnering, of course, with people here at Portland State. John MacArthur in the back uh, is somebody I've been working with on uh, issues uh, related to this for a couple of years now. So uh, one of the projects that we're working on now, I'll talk a little bit about uh, near the end uh, and uh, acknowledge John on that. Um, there's several grad students uh, that have basically done all this work, okay? Uh, Casey Langford, Nirbesh Dekal, uh, Rajiv Khatri and Mojda Azad are kind of the core uh, students who have, an, have worked on this and are working on this now. And so I want to acknowledge them as well. Um, and again, they do a lot of the really uh, tough work uh, as it gets into cleaning up and grinding through this data. So uh, the outline, basically, we're, we're going to, um, I'll talk quickly. Uh, briefly about you know what is probe data and what we what we mean by that or what I mean by that I'm sure there's multiple definitions and, and so on uh, and then uh, we'll get into kind of four case studies so we're going to talk about four applications of using probe data to say something meaningful I think I hope it's meaningful about uh, bicycling okay and, and how that's changed over time and these four case studies look at uh, kind of a bike share e-bike share system that we did a few years ago and looked at kind of a surrogate for safety behavior uh, using GPS data. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about a fleet of instrumented, I, I quote, grid bike share bikes. This is the grid bike share in Phoenix, Arizona. That's social bikes, same as you have here in Portland. Uh, same company, that is. And we looked at route choice on that, kind of building off of some of the work that folks here at uh, Portland State have done. Uh, Next, looking at ride, wrong way riding uh, on one-way streets, basically, in, uh, in, a, in a dense urban area, uh, using smartphone data, using data from dedicated apps and, and smartphone data. And then last, uh, some work we're in the middle of now, uh, focusing on e-bikes and bike share systems. And uh, we have the safety and health angle that we're kind of aiming at there. Okay. So those are the four case studies. Well, I'll spend you know five, ten minutes on, well, probably five minutes on each one, uh, and uh, and then we'll talk about kind of the next steps and conclusions and so on. So, brief introduction. Uh, cycling is really becoming part of this data revolution, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it kind of started with like the map my run, map my ride, and and has trickled into kind of a more uh, and those, of course, are still apps that are doing a lot of very interesting work uh, and scaled up at, with Strava and other uh, companies that are getting more engaged in sort of trying to understand urban cycling behavior. Uh, Love to Ride is a company that could, uh, kind of uh, conglomerate, com uh, it's not a conglomerate, it agglomerates all of this data and uses it to uh, develop kind of a, a, a motivation and encouragement programs 
uh, competitions. Uh, and so these are sorts of things that are very interesting, I think, uh, and provide a lot of data of the people that use the apps, okay? So Strava, for example, started and kind of is uh, a fitness competition type of uh, application. Uh, again, they're trying to understand how well uh, they integrate in uh, to conventional commuting type of cycling. Uh, when I moved here, I used Strava one time to measure my commute in, and I used it one time to measure my commute back, and now I don't, don't use it, but I just know that that's how much my uh, commute was. So at any rate, uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about Strava because there's a, for a number of reasons. Uh, Cycle Tracks is kind of an open source uh, application that does some of the same things that Strava does without the big uh, competition social media element. Uh, and this is uh, something that's translated to several cities through this open source platform. We're, we used a cycle tracks based app uh, for some of the data we, we have uh, developed. Okay. The right side is this other new sort of emerging technology, and that's bike share. Okay. Bike share data up until a few years ago uh, really focused on station level data. A lot of the analysis was looking at uh, understanding flows of bikes between stations, but we didn't really know a lot of information about the station, uh, or, or about the trip, rather, uh, that didn't really include, that includes so much more information than just a rider picked up a bike at this station and dropped it off at some other station. Uh, that level of analysis is good for operations, research, and other things, but really if we care a lot about dry, rider behavior, we're interested in kind of the, the point by point root data and other things. So uh, you recognize the orange. That's not Tennessee orange. That's Bike Town orange. Uh, for those of you who are Vols fans, any Vols fans? Probably not, but anyways. Uh, the, the Tennessee orange uh, or the Bike Town orange, which is kind of the same shade, uh, makes me feel at home around here. Uh, but this little box has a lot of information in it, okay? It's not simple. This is the smart bike model that a lot of bike share companies are moving towards. And this smart bike has, collects data on where the bike is along the trip. So you can actually get it information about route choice. You can maybe start thinking about speeds and other sort of safety metrics uh, and so on. And then on the bottom, of course, the big news in bike share, for those of you who've tracked uh, bike share, is these dockless bike sharing systems that are emerging throughout Asia, throughout China, but entering into U.S. markets also. Seattle, for example, is the notable Northwest example of that. Uh, some chatter about uh, Portland and other places. So the idea here, of course, is that the bike is kind of a probe for all kinds of information about the user and about where they go and, and so on. And this is why a lot of the big tech companies, social media companies, are pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into bike share bikes, okay, uh, in part to pull that sort of bike share part of their, part of someone's activity pattern into their ecosystem, okay, into their data uh, analytics ecosystem. So this is kind of an interesting uh, revolution, evolution of bike share is it's, it's becoming part of the, the social media tech uh, universe, okay. And of course it has really nice data if you can get at it. And we'll talk a little bit about data ownership and what that means for research and for analysis and planning and so on later on. Okay, So that's the framework. We're really looking at two different types of data here. Uh, and we have applications, uh, three applications on the kind of right side and one here that we're going to talk on the left side that we're going to talk about as we move forward. Okay, All right. So uh, oh, yeah, we're not quite there yet. Uh, so these are the types of data sets that you're able to see. Uh, for example, uh, we built uh, iBike Knox, uh, cycle tracks uh, modification, a branch off the cycle tracks open source along with Cycle Philly and other things. And uh, so this is the map for Knoxville. University of Tennessee is this uh, uh, little bubble here, uh, and this is downtown right here, and you've got these radial street networks that go out. And then Strava's on the top, and, and uh, you know, we didn't do any hard analysis here, but you can kind of see the pattern re reflects relatively well between the two where riders ride in Knoxville. Uh, the iBike Knox app was just up for a little while when I made this map, so there's not a, uh, the, uh, the, 
the volume of data is pretty small, but it still kind of reflects the same patterns that a much larger Strava volume created. So that's one of the things that Strava is trying to understand is really how well they represent. Now, the iBike Knox data is almost exclusively utilitarian trips, uh, and the Strava data may not be. Uh, it they're trying to understand, of course, all of that stuff. Okay. And then the, the fleet bike share bikes, uh, they provide a lot of data as well. And you can see this is a map of some of our uh, um, Baltimore bike share data that we have. And you can see the second by second uh, uh, breadcrumbs, essentially, and as they go through an intersection. And then you can kind of scale that up to the network. All right. So case study one is this one that we've, we did a few years ago. So it's a little, uh, it's uh, the oldest one of the, of the presentation. Uh, we, we built this uh, bike share system in 2011 or so. Uh, we call it Cycle You Share, and it's a platform to do research, okay? It, wasn't, it was before any of the bike share companies, the commercial bike share companies, had any sort of onboard tracking. And importantly, is before they had any uh, electric bikes mixed into their fleet. So we really wanted to know how electric bikes could influence bike share. So we uh, created these two stations just like this. We had a mix of bike share bikes and e-bikes, uh, uh, e-bikes and conventional bikes mixed in. And we measured how people used the different types of bikes. And of course, what we liked uh, about this is we had full control over the data, full access to everything that we needed to know about it. And we instrumented our bikes with GPS devices, essentially. We wanted to do a whole bunch more, but you know. Sometimes it doesn't work out. So this is our, our uh, data. The red lines, the, the width of the line, of course, represents the volume of data on those links. And you can see there's the University of Tennessee on this little peninsula. To the right is downtown. Uh, this grid to the north is kind of a big residential district. Port Sanders is what it's called. Okay? And, uh, and so you see where people use their bikes. And, and all of this data allows us to understand some things that people are asking about e-bikes, for example. Are e-bikes faster than conventional bikes? Uh, if we just have origin destination data, we don't know anything about that, really. Uh, do e-bikes, the, there's a hypothesis that we pr propose that e-bikes may stop at stop signs more because they don't have to work so hard to speed up. They may uh, stop at uh, red lights more. Uh, and they may go the long way around a one-way street uh, to, to comply with the, the one-way street network uh, because they don't, have to, they don't have to worry about taking shortcuts and working an extra little bit to, um, to ride in compliance with the traffic control. So that was our hypothesis, was that maybe e-bikes are uh, act differently because they're e-bikes. And what we found is not, that didn't happen. Okay, so here's the big results. And, and we can talk about methods offline. If, I spend, if we get into the details of this, we can, almost, we can just talk about this study for the full time. But uh, we looked at spot, speed, stop sign compliance, traffic signal compliance, and wrong way riding. I'll start at speed. Uh, we compared the speed of cyclists and e-bike riders uh, on different facilities. Okay, we looked on, on different, street, different types of streets, on, on shared use pathways. Uh, streets with high ADT, streets with low ADT, and so on. And what we found, uh, the one takeaway message here is that on the road, e-bikes were about two kilometers per hour faster than conventional bicycles. So when they rode in mixed traffic, they were two kilometers per hour faster. On the pathways, e-bikes were about one and a half kilometers slower than the conventional bicycles, okay? We don't really know why this is. Uh, we can speculate that maybe when a conventional bike rider rides on a shared use path, and our shared use paths are these kind of parkways, uh, the, the conventional bicycle might be trying to get exercise or ride fast for some other reason. Uh, and of course, the e-bike rider on a roadway might be trying to keep up with traffic, okay? And using that extra boost to help keep up with traffic. So that's one of the speculations. The implication here is that, uh, uh, agency that says e-bikes are not allowed on our shared use pathways might, because they, they ride too fast, that might not be a, a true statement, uh, judging by this small sample. Okay? This is a small study, but it's still a piece of data uh, that we can lean on. Okay? Uh, we looked at stop con sign compliance, and of course we had a hard time with second-by-second -second data saying, 
this person came to a full and complete stop. So what we did is we just measured the speed through a stop sign buffer area. Uh, whether they, we, we drew cordons around the approach, and we measured their speed through that cordon. And what we found is that, uh, of course, uh, there's very low stop sign compliance, okay, uh, which is what we might expect for both e-bikes and conventional bicyclists. And they follow the same track. Sorry about the, the, the resolution here. The bottom axis is speed. The, the, the uh, uh, y-axis, rather, is the compliance rate. And the non-compliance rate is like 80% non-compliance at like 4 kilometers an hour. Okay? And as you speed up, uh, the, the so-called compliance goes uh, up, uh, you could say. Okay? So the, the takeaway here is that e-bikes don't stop because they have all this extra power to speed back up. They just roll through stop signs just like conventional bi bike riders do. Uh, we found about the same thing with red lights. We, we paired red light signal timing plans with uh, our GPS data for our fixed time signals only. And we found that, that we could match whether a, a, a GPS track arrived at a signal on, at a red light or on a green light. And we measured the same, we used the same sort of chart to, to track significant differences. There were some small differences. Uh, the bicycle red light running rate was actually lower than e-bike red light running rate. Okay? And then uh, last, we looked at wrong way riding. We, we built these buffers around especially one-way streets, but also some wide two-way streets. And we found, again, that the, that e-bikes ride wrong way on one-way streets at the same rate as bicycles. Uh, so our conclusion is, essentially, that e-bikes and bicycles are about the same. These are the same group of riders, of course, because they're the subscribers of our bike share system. And our subscribers use interchangeably bikes, conventional bikes and e-bikes. So it was kind of interesting. So uh, the, the violation rate, about 47% of our trips had links that had one-way one violations. Not the whole trip, of course, but had a link in there where, where the rider violated one-way streets. And we have a, a, a one-way network that's, that creates that kind of scenario, that situation. Okay? So that's our case study one, or case uh, one of using data as this bike share and e-bike safety. This study has been used, again, uh, uh, to sort of inform some of the e-bike policy debate about where e-bikes belong on the roadway network. Um, and the conclusion, I would say, is that e-bikes practically, uh, uh, based on this, should be treated like bicycles, this type of e-bike at least, this kind of slower, what we call class one e-bike. The second case uh, is commercial bike share route choice, okay? So our data was small. We had, a, we had 20 bikes total. We had about 100 subscribers. Uh, and of those 100, about, you know, it's the 80-20 rule, about 20%, 20 of those subscribers constitute about 80% of our trips. So this, we wanted to scale up, and, and we wanted a, 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 a system that had a real network, a system that had a, a good street network and a big network of bike share stations. And of course, we wanted a bike share operator that actually tracked their bikes, not their stations, okay? So we used, we partnered with uh, so, Social Bikes, Social Bicycles, uh, and their, one of their big first deployments was Grid Bike Share. And we pulled data from that system, uh, with their help, of course. And we uh, tried to understand route choice in a grid. And it's nice that the name of the bike share system is grid. In a nice grid, you have many, many options that maybe have the exact same travel, time, uh, travel distance, but many different routes that can connect you to those points. So you can actually see what factors influence somebody's route choice. If we did something like this in Knoxville, we'd have much fewer feasible routes to test against because we don't have a, as built out of a, a grid street network because we have these bottlenecks and terrain issues and other things. Okay, so we got five months of data. Uh, we had about 9,000, we had about 20,000 trips total. We ended up with about 9,000 trips and 1,800 users and we were able to measure casual and registered users. And we focused on utilitarian trips. I'll show you why. So here's a nice, uh, you can kind of see the, this is my first slide too. You can kind of see the blue breadcrumb trail from by one station to another. This person has, I don't know how you figure it out, uh, probably seven or eight 
routes that they could take that would be equal distance. Uh, maybe not quite that long. Uh, and they chose this down, down one block, right two, down one. Okay, and that was their route. And we can generate uh, three or four other routes at least uh, that would have that same distance that that user chose to avoid for some reason. Okay, uh, and we got rid of what we thought, what we guessed were recreational trips, and this is one of those, okay? You can see the little red line there that connects uh, route one to, or station, checkout station to check-in station, but then you follow the track of the user. This is the uh, so-called breadcrumb data from the GPS, and you see first they went north, then they turned around and went south, and then they went way east and through some neighborhoods and out and about and around, and then back down and then back up, and then they return their, their, uh, the bike at, at a station relatively close to their checkout station. So the, the idea here, of course, is we cannot generate a route choice model based on a track like that. The user is doing things that we would think are irrational if this is a, a utilitarian trip, but maybe they're stopping other places. We just don't know that, okay? So uh, we got rid of a bunch of data that looked like this. All right, so what we ended up with is this uh, uh, generation of these Choice sets, uh, again, following uh, some of the work done here, some of the root choice literature. Uh, and we uh, identified these alternative routes that were feasible, that did things that uh, were rational, like minimizing distance, minimizing one-way segments, minimize, maximizing bike facilities, whatever it may be. And we calculated our root choice model based on that, okay? Uh, and so we would end up with, a, for every trip, a map that looked something like this, okay? It wasn't a map. It was a series of, it was a bunch of data that looked something like this that represented the network along this uh, map, okay? All right, so what we did is we did this, uh, we created this model, generated, uh, uh, tried to understand some of the factors. Uh, of course, this is overlaid on the street network and all the attributes of the street that we know and tried to understand the proportion. These are the, the variables that kind of popped out as uh, significant. Proportion of bike facilities, uh, number of left turns per mile, number of right turns per mile, uh, proportion of one-way trips, uh, number of signals per mile, uh, sorry, proportion of one-way segments, uh, the traffic levels on streets, AADT, uh, the length, uh, we interacted the distance of the trip times the peak hour, the proportion of bike lanes, times peak hour, okay, and you don't have to dig into this. I, we did this marginal rate of substitution calculation where we tried to understand how much distance one would be willing to trade for a bike lane, how much distance one would be willing to trade for removing left turns or right turns or so on. So uh, what this means is a percentage distance uh, change for a marginal difference in bike uh, in, uh, in some parameter. It's a little easier to interpret here. So what we see is the thing that matters the most is bike facilities. People do these big detours to get on a bike facility, okay? Or uh, the bike facility reduces their overall disutility of riding a bicycle on a segment. So you could look at it that way. Uh, that's that big negative symbol there. Uh, number of right turns, number of left turns, about the same. You'll notice the casual users, the casual subscribers are a bit more sensitive to some of these things, or they don't know their way to meander through a network uh, is another way to think about that. Uh, whereas uh, the registered subscribers, they might have figured out the perfect route that maximizes their utility, and so uh, they, they can do these sorts of things. Uh, proportion of one-way facilities, this is the one that kind of popped out as uh, negative for one and positive for the other. Uh, essentially, uh, if, uh, but it's also got an interaction term on the bottom. So basically, it's all kind of a positive, uh, you could say a disutility. That is, as these one-way facilities goes up, it creates this sort of uh, negative kind of distance effect. It feels like you're traveling farther than you are, okay? And then number of signals. So the point is, uh, uh, bike facilities really matter. These other attributes also matter a little bit, and that casual subscribers kind of have a bigger effect, uh, kind of more sensitive than registered subscribers who are maybe more used to riding on these facilities, okay? All right. So that's case two. And then moving to uh, case three is using app data. Here we're using uh, cycle tracks 
application, Cyclophily, uh, kind of a branch of cycle tracks. And one of the things that we found in the first study was this wrong way riding behavior, uh, but it was, we had a, we, it was a smaller sample. We actually looked at what wrong way riding in the second study too, I didn't report on that, but we found wrong way riding behaviors for uh, uh, um, about 20% uh, wrong way riding behavior uh, with bike facilities and without bike facilities about 40% wrong way riding behavior. And actually right when we finished the study, City of Phoenix did this um, big campaign against wrong way riding on their streets. If you've been to Phoenix, you, recognize, you re remember maybe the big wide arterials, big super block type of arterials, and you find people uh, not willing to cross six lanes of traffic to get on the right side of the road, okay? And so this sign uh, is the wrong way riding sign. You can see the red sign there. Uh, they put that on the backs of, uh, of conventional signs for the cars, speed limit signs and other things, so that if you're riding in the wrong direction, uh, you, don't, you see that sign and it tells you something. Okay, I've seen these in D.C. I haven't seen them here yet. Uh, they might exist. Maybe I don't ride wrong way enough yet to, to actually see them, but uh, uh, that's one approach. The other approach, of course, is you can find these places that uh, have a lot of wrong way riding. Instead of put up a sign that prohibits that, you can build a piece of infrastructure like a two-way cycle track that uh, allows the user to to use that link as a kind of a wrong way link. And that's, of course, one of the strategies as well. Okay, So there's not a lot of data on wrong way crashes. You can dig into any data set and probably figure it out. There was a study in DC, uh, I think it was DC, uh, that found about 12% of bike crashes are, are attributed to kind of wrong way riding, or, or that's a contributor. Uh, in Knoxville, they just did a big analysis and found about 10% of all bike crashes uh, are are kind of caused by wrong way riding or contributed by wrong way riding, whether that's on sidewalk or on the street, okay? And so we uh, were able to get a hold of the Cycle Philly data set, uh, it, and it, Philadelphia has a huge one-way street network, very tight, very packed. And the thing that really ha makes that important for us is with this GPS probe data, we really need unambiguous wrong way riding. Okay, so it's a, it's a little, you got to do some data tricks to figure out if somebody's wrong way riding on a two-way street. Uh, but it's a little easier to understand if you're wrong way riding on a two-way pair, meaning a block apart. Okay, we can, we can say with some certainty that's, a, that, that's what we can do. So we ended up with this two years of data, 3,000 trips, about 180 users, I think. Uh, and these are valid trips. Uh, again, we peeled off duplicates and all these other things that, that occur with this sort of data. And then we found that about 2.5%, 2.7% of the distance traveled in the entire uh, data set was wrong way riding, okay? Uh, and then about 42% of the trips had at least one wrong way riding segment as we described it, as we defined it, okay? So this is a kind of interesting piece uh, because it's, we're trying to get at this notion of can we build infrastructure. I, I say to my undergrad students in design, uh, I say, we need to build infrastructure that is irresistible for the user to do the right thing, okay? Putting up a sign and saying ride with traffic, which means cross six lanes of traffic at the intersection way back there or way up there and then ride the right way and then cross again to get to the store on the same block, that's not irresistible, okay? Irresistible is building a two-way cycle track where they ride, quote, wrong way on a one-way street in the cycle track with the supportive infrastructure. Okay. Of course, the stickers are che cheaper and easier. Okay. All right, so here's, the, here's Philadelphia. These are three maps. Starting from the left, the red lines indicate one-way streets on the Philadelphia street network. Okay. So this is a dense urban grid of one-way streets. That just makes it perfect for us. We got really excited when we started digging into this data set as opposed to some of the others. Uh, the red line, the, the blue lines are the ones we pulled out of the total data set that kind of reflect uh, high volumes of, of vehicle, of, of uh, uh, one-way riding, okay, in our data. And then the blue, the, so that's both wrong way and right way, one way riding. And then the uh, right pane 
is the wrong way riding segments, and the weight width of the, the line represents how much wrong way riding you have. So you can see you have, oh, I'm going to use my mouse, like the AV guy told me. So you can see there's little segments that are wrong way riding, these little clusters. So for example, this little bubble here, oops, sorry, uh, is a little uh, wrong way segment that is irresistible to ride wrong way, OK? Everybody does it. And for some reason, there's some design parameter there that, that begs the, the, the law-abiding cyclists to ride wrong way, maybe. I don't know if they're law-abiding or not. But uh, we, have, we can use this as kind of a tactical design uh, approach and say, OK, we're going to go in and we're going to look at these little bubbles and find out what's going on there. Or we can look at it in a larger way like we did. So, what we did is we found uh, what were the ride or rider predictors of wrong way riding. Let me just point out one thing. These apps have more data than just points on a map. These apps have data about the rider okay, and the, about the trip if you enter it in. Uh, so uh, Cycle Philly, you can enter in your age, your income, the type of rider you are, whether you're the strong or fearless rider or the enthused and, and confident rider, whatever. Uh, and so they have more data than, than uh, just a bike share trip. Uh, bike share companies, and we're working with uh, Bill Wagon on this, have a little bit of data on their subscribers uh, that we can match to the, the trip, but not a lot, OK? This one has age, gender, the, and the like. What we found, though, is none of that really seemed to matter, OK, uh, from what we, the data that we had. What mattered, of course, was commute purpose. Uh, Commuters had higher wrong way riding than non-commuters, uh, for non-commute trips, that is. I, I, I kind of, that was a little bit different than the grid uh, project, where so-called subscribers, which we think of as more uh, regular users, commuters, and so on, uh, had a lower prevalence of wrong way riding, whereas commute riders here uh, had uh, higher wrong way riding. And then, of course, trip length and time. The longer your trip, the higher the chance that your trip would include wrong way riding segments on it. Of course, okay? That's uh, something we expect. And then we did this. Then we wanted to understand how segment level, uh, do a segment level analysis to understand how segments impacted, uh, attributes of a segment impacted wrong way riding. And what we found is that sharrows, buffers, connector, what, quote, connector streets in, in their bike network that we coded in uh, had lower rates of wrong way riding. Uh, conventional bike lanes had higher rates of wrong way riding than than other streets, and uh, than than nothing at all, and then these other treatments, and that's not that's a correlation. We're not saying that's necessarily a causation. It could be that there's bike lanes. Uh, what we what we found digging in the data is people would commute up a bike lane, one direction, and then they commute back, presumably on the other uh, route. Okay, that was the let's say the southbound bike lane, uh, and. That's what you're supposed to do. But what we found, of course, is that people would sometimes come back the way they came on a one-way street and then work their way over to, uh, to get on the right road. So bike lanes are kind of an indicator for high volumes of bike traffic. So when you sort of scale up high volumes of bike traffic, uh, you probably scale up violations as well when you have a lot of chances for violations. So we're not, or it could also mean that if somebody's got a bike lane, they feel like they can go wrong way in a bike lane. It could be a causal factor. We don't, just don't know. But uh, intuition suggests, as a cyclist, that suggests uh, if I got to ride wrong way on a, on a road, I would rather ride wrong way in a bike lane than wrong way in a car lane. Okay, And so that might be part of it. But we, we do find that these buffered bike lanes don't produce that same result, even though those are not as prevalent. Um, higher ADT. Uh, Daily traffic has lower wrong way riding. I don't like to ride bikes against cars on wrong way streets. That's uh, in intuitive. And then multiple lanes, though, have higher wrong way traffic, wrong way riding. So I guess if there's a lot of lanes that I can sort of squeeze in and ride wrong way, I'll do that. Okay. Or if I ride on the sidewalk. So that's something we didn't capture here. That's a point we're saying is uh, we don't have, we can't tell if they're on the sidewalk riding wrong way or if they're riding wrong way in the street. Okay. All right, so case four, I'll try to go quickly through the, the last one. This is a work in progress. This is with John and, uh, and some others. Uh, 
We're working with Baltimore Bike Share, with the Wagon is the, the parent company of that, or the technology supplier at least. And this is another uh, uh, one of these sort of uh, uh, bike share systems with a lot of uh, technology on board, and they have uh, electric bikes as well. So that's an important part that we're interested in is uh, we actually have sort of tracking data for a big fleet of electric bikes. We've only, we have two months of data now. We're trying to get the, the rest of it. About 4,300 trips, 1,400 users, uh, and we're investigating uh, differences between e-bikes and bicycles. Uh, the key here is there's really no difference in bike design except the e-assist with our other system that we launched uh, years ago. Uh, the cycle you share system, the bikes were very different. So somebody could choose a conventional bicycle because they like the feel of that bike or, or something else. Uh, these are essentially the same bikes. One has a motor and one doesn't. Okay. So here's a speed uh, distribution, a PDF. And you can see the, the blue is e-bikes and the red is bicycles. And the speed of the e-bikes are higher on average, a couple of kilometers per hour higher on average. And so that's an important uh, finding. Uh, all else equal, speed is higher, okay, for, for conventional, for e-bikes as opposed to conventional bikes. And we're trying to break this down a little bit. Uh, since we have the routes, we have every piece of information we need, uh, we put together this map. My student, Mojda, put together this map. Uh, and it has the speed difference of cyclists and e-bikes on average for every segment of road that, that those vehicles travel on. So this is Baltimore. If you've been there, that's the downtown area above the harbor there. And you can see the green means there's not much difference between conventional bicycles and e-bikes. And the red means that the e-bikes can be up to, let's see, two to five kilometers per hour faster on average for those segments. So you see differences here. You see a lot more red in the bottom. You see red on these bigger streets. You get into the dense urban area, you see there's not much difference at all. Okay? And so looking at Google Map, uh, Street View, you can, we pulled out some of these, what we'd say is representative segments. Uh, the top one is kind of a, your typical kind of large urban arterial. Uh, and that's where we have kind of a greenish shade. And these red shades are these more rural spread out uh, spread out destinations, probably spread out signal systems and others, uh, probably higher speed roadways. This uh, top right here is a big high speed, what is that, four lane roadway. And so a, an e-bike rider might say, I'm going to get off of this road by riding as fast as I can to, to move uh, off of it. Whereas a conventional bike rider may do the same thing but not be able to get up to that speed. So those are the kind of ways we're breaking this data down. We're doing some other things related to physical activity and health. We don't have time to talk about, but uh, that's kind of next steps. All right. So in conclusion, uh, these, there's, these are sort of four examples of the, the boundless possibilities for using this kind of data. Imagine 10 years ago saying that we could understand at the level of having thousands of cyclists or thousands of trips at least, this precise level of detail. And it's really amazing that uh, we're in a time that this is becoming possible and, and uh, kind of easier to do than, than in the past. Um, so un un level, unprecedented levels of uh, kind of analysis on behavior, safety, health, uh, et cetera. There's sort of some very clear applications there. There are some other less clear applications, or maybe Google thinks it's a very clear application, where you get into consumer applications trying to understand uh, intelligence, marketing, et cetera. And uh, instrumented bike share is kind of uh, one of the platforms for that level of analysis from the consumer level, targeted marketing and so on. Um, one of the interesting things here also is you have this different kind of levels of resolution uh, of the data that allow different levels of analysis. So for example, Strava data has segment level analysis that uh, is really useful for counts and some other things, they, and they have other applications as well. I'm not trying to minimize that. But they don't turn over at least the breadcrumb data, that is the point-by-point -point data. And so you can't really say something very important or interesting about the design of an intersection and how that affects behavior. Okay? So I just threw up this, uh, this is Knoxville, this is our iBike Knox, this is a couple weeks of data through this really tricky intersection. And you can see on the bottom, everything kind of blobs into the left, which is a minor road, bottom left there. 
And then we, they have to cross this uh, five-plus lane high-speed roadway to get on a bridge. To the bottom left is student housing. To the top left across the river is the University of Tennessee. And so what a lot of people do is they take a shortcut. I'll use the mouse here. And the, instead, of, uh, instead of coming up here and crossing like these uh, good citizens do, or these law abiders who, who, uh, who maybe are uh, being more risky, I don't know, okay? Uh, they actually just take a shortcut and they go wrong way up this, either the bike lane or up the sidewalk. And in fact, I went on a bike ride a couple weeks ago with a city traffic engineer, uh, bike engineer, and we did the same thing, okay? And I guess that's on the record now. But anyways, that's, uh, that's the idea, right? Because it's so much easier. And it feels safer, it probably is safer to do that, okay? Uh, because on the other end, you have to do the same thing to get across Henley Street again. So you've got to do these two kind of big, dangerous, mega intersection crossings. Uh, some folks at Tool and others are working to try to fix this. It's a T-dot road, so there's all kinds of interesting opinions about good design on, for cyclists there. But a, a, a couple things you notice here. One is you can notice this fellow did this and decided, well, I don't know which direction here they're going, but they decided I'm going to get to the right side of the road whenever I got a big gap. I'm not going to do it at the intersection. And you see the same happen up above with these two, okay? Uh, so they crossed kind of mid-block in the middle of the bridge to get to the correct side of the road, and they didn't bother with all the congestion of the intersection. The key is, once you, do, you start storing and archiving all this data, you can go back and say, oh, this, this is a problem. Look at all these months, years of data that we have to, to show this problem, and now let's fix it, and we don't have to do our before analysis anymore. Let's just do the fix, and then we already have our sort of pre-analysis done because we have all the data archived, okay? And you can do this across your entire urban area or wherever your data goes, so Strava, nation, statewide, nationwide, whatever. Uh, and that's really an important and interesting piece of information that, that you basically are collecting all this ambient data already to, to see how, how we do this, okay? Kind of getting to the level that we do with traffic engineering already, okay? Uh, so the key, though, of course, is data ownership matters. Uh, understand how, figuring out how to access this data is important. Uh, as researchers, we can seem to get access to data that, that maybe as, uh, uh, for research purposes is something uh, slightly different than a municipality and so on. So uh, that's, an, that's kind of a key aspect of this. And because of that, it's a, there's a market for data, of course, as we all know now, right? We've got a lot of private companies providing data services to municipalities. So uh, understanding what you need and who owns the data that can answer that question is important, okay? And so that, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of future sort of directions we're going. We're trying to integrating some machine learning uh, into the data to understand trip purpose, other indicators more cl clearly. Uh, we, we can say pretty uh, reliably that the same person takes the same trip every day, so that must be some important trip for them, like their commute trip. Uh, if we ask them that one time, uh, like Google asks me, hey, you know, we need a little human help with this uh, store. Is it open right now? You know, I get those sort of questions on my phone a lot, and that, that sort of feeds into their, their learning, okay? Uh, we can do the same for transportation with some kind of small tweaks, okay? Uh, more precision, better analysis for sustainability outcomes. We really know vehicle miles traveled and so on. Uh, we could really know displaced transportation modes. Uh, we've done some work uh, related to physical activity modeling with this sort of data. And uh, validate, if we can validate that sort of data very well, then we can have a huge cohort of physical activity data uh, that goes beyond your typical instrumented human where you're covered with sensors and so on riding a bicycle. Okay. And then uh, the, one of the key challenges, of course, with all of our, I should have said that at the very beginning, all of these are non-representative data samples, okay? These are not uh, um, fully representative, I should say. They're representative of a class of rider who uses an app or rides bike share or something like that, okay? We don't know how representative they are to uh, the, person, the person who's riding the, the Walmart bike to work every day uh, because that's what they can afford because they're probably not using our app uh, or whatever, okay? So we're trying to understand how we can apply these findings to a broader sense. Strava's doing a lot of good work. I keep saying Strava, but 
uh, we didn't use Strava data. They're doing a lot of good work trying to validate with counts and other things, and, and that's part of their business model, I guess. Okay. So with that, uh, thanks. Uh, we'll open for questions real quick. Acknowledge Southeast Transportation Center, uh, Collaborative Roadway, uh, Collaborative Science Center for Road Safety. Uh, those are two UTCs that have funded or supported at least this work in various ways. The Light Electric Vehicle Education Research Initiative, which me and John are working on, focusing on e sorry e-bike analysis, is is something that we're uh, is sort of an umbrella for a lot of the work we do as it relates to e-bikes. And then, of course, the data provider, Social Bikes, Bowegan, and the DCR, DVRPC, uh, Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, provided the um, cycle filling data. So, and worked with not only that, but they really helped us with trying to get the data in a format that worked with us and all the underlying data and everything else. So, uh, appreciate their help. So, with that, I'll leave it open to questions, and uh, you can contact me uh, according to this as you'd like, okay? Uh, my name is Christine. And uh, could you uh, spend a little more time on what you just talked about, the uh, validation of physical activity models to assess health outcomes? Yeah, so what we did with our, uh, our cycle you share, bike share, is we actually put um, power meters on the bikes to measure uh, how much uh, power the user put in uh, on both bicycles and e-bikes. So that, and uh, we also ran an experiment where we had heart rate monitors and other things on them. So we can, this is on a fixed course, okay? Uh, this is a, a small experiment. We published a paper this year on that. Uh, and we measured physical activity differences between e walking, conventional biking, and e-bike riding. Uh, using our vehicles as a platform. Now, if we can develop that sort of understanding, like how much uh, uh, human power is required to move a, a Baltimore bike share bike, uh, four miles an hour, 10 miles an hour, whatever, on flat ground, then we can uh, apply that sort of analysis. And if we can validate that, we can apply that sort of analysis on physical activity at least, okay? for using bike share bikes and conventional bicycles in a bike sharing system. Now, uh, the, the, the hope then is you have this much bigger cohort, essentially, of people who are uh, running these bikes around and you can, you can gather a lot more data than a, a traditional study. Our study had 18 riders, okay? Uh, and that's what a lot of these kind of experiments uh, that measure physical activity have are these like, you know, handful, dozen or two uh, uh, subjects that are running these uh, vehicles around, okay? We want hundreds. That's really what, uh, what we're interested in. And uh, we're also interested in more realistic uh, behavior. Like we ran our, and a lot of these studies do the same, ran our, uh, uh, subjects around a fixed course that was uh, four kilometers in distance. Uh, what we found in our research is that e-bike riders ride farther, okay? And so uh, because e-bike riders ride farther, then the diminished physical activity they get per mile is actually uh, expanded a little bit because of their longer trip. So those are the sorts of things we want to get at as it relates to physical activity and health, okay? And trying to understand that at a bigger scale. With e-bikes, we might be able to log a lot more data as well, and that's what we're trying to work on, about how much energy the motor's putting in, how much energy the user's putting in, because it's all part of the sensor system of an e-bike. So if we can get all that out, we'll have a lot of really interesting data. Yep. Yep. Uh, I guess my question, it's more of a general question about how you would like to compile the data sets and you know, pull information out of it, but um, automobile traffic, does it significantly influence uh, user behavior, like uh, like rush hour, for example. Somebody might, you know, if they're dealing with a lot of congestion everywhere, obviously yeah. that's probably going to scale your data all across the set, right? Yeah, so um, we measure, when we used our average annual daily traffic, AADT, we're using one number for a segment that, that was captured 
using the, the sort of Federal Highway Administration's type of standard for measuring AADT, or different DOTs have different approaches to measuring that every year or every couple of years for a road segment for their traffic monitoring. So the, the idea was we're interested in, is this a high volume road or a low volume road? We don't know kind of that day-to-day -day, uh, traffic, uh, travel uh, behavior as it relates to traffic. One of the things I'd like to do is you, got, you have these uh, data providers now, Oregon has their, theirs, that you can go back in time and you can find out what the, travel sp the, the vehicle speed on different segments was uh, on a certain date uh, at the, at the um, Trek uh, Summit uh, last September. Uh, there was a demonstration. They, they went back in time and looked at what the travel was. Travel, uh, the speeds were at different times of the day on the day of the eclipse. And so you could actually go and say, my GPS point was taken on this segment on uh, September 27th, 2017. And I'm going to go and cross-reference this other data set and try to understand what the speed of the cars on that segment was on that day at that time. And then you can try to understand that. You can do the same for weather also. There's pretty high-resolution weather data, precipitation, light, dark, whatever. And you, that's, something, that's sort of a, a, a next level. You, one of the projects we have with this CSCRS is trying to figure out ways to fuse a lot of data for safety analysis. And, and those sorts of data are, are part of that. So we did, but to answer your question directly, we didn't do that. Okay. Um, I was curious with your the Wagon uh, study, what what was the speed that those bikes top out at? Because I know that can be set by the city. Yeah, it's a good question, and I'm not quite sure uh, off the top of my head. I, I, I've heard it, but I don't remember what it is. The, the, there's a class system for e-bike regulation. Uh, the bike share industry is not like, for example, the first launch of a bike share in the U.S. was in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, where, sorry, e-bike sharing system was in Birmingham, Alabama, where e-bikes are effectively illegal. So uh, I don't know exactly how they uh, play within the, the rules, but there's a class-based system, 20 miles an hour is max, usually, okay, uh, for uh, conventional e-bikes. Uh, there's another class, too, that's above that. Uh, so I would expect that 20 miles an hour would have to be kind of a ceiling. Whether they're slower than that, I'm not sure. Uh, and so it's hard to ride any bike share bike 20 miles an hour uh, if, you've, if you've ridden those. But um, I'm not sure exactly uh, the Bill Wagon one. Okay? And, of course, that's, the, that's when power stops being supplied to the motor. You can pedal as fast as the gearing and everything else will allow you. But most of the time, they're, they're pretty low. Okay. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Do you think, like, as they can track, like, uh, speed and, like, roadways, maybe in the future they can, like, send fines to some uh, bikers based on the data that they have? Yeah, so the, the interesting part about this, and uh, the, it's, a, it's a debate among the entire transportation industry is kind of automated enforcement uh, using telematics data uh, for trucks, for all sorts of uh, applications. Okay, so a lot of the big rig trucks have all this data kind of compiling. You know when and where the trucks were speeding and, and, and so on. You can do the same for bikes. Uh, that's where you get into the question of uh, terms and conditions, who owns the data, whether it's voluntary or not. Uh, for fleets, it's certainly something that fleet own managers are tracking. Uh, we, when we were running our bike share system, were tracking bad behavior uh, and trying to identify if people were uh, being reckless with our, our system. And part of that was uh, because we wanted them to be safe. The other part was the administration at the University of Tennessee was incredibly concerned about uh, the behavior of these cyclists. And, uh, when we were trying to get approval to put the system in, and that was one of the ways that we could assuage that concern. We, said, we, we know if somebody's being reckless, and we can shut them out of the system if, we, if they have this sort of level of violation. So um, automated enforcement of every cyclist uh, using an app or something like that would be, it would force me not to use the app, if that's, uh, and that would be a, something to think about. Okay. 
difference between a heat packet writer and a conventional packet writer? No, not yet. Uh, that was that was our one of the big dreams of our uh, Knoxville pilot. We just didn't have kind of the route uh, um, variability, route choice variability that we wanted or the volume of data that we wanted. Knoxville has great hills, uh, has lousy streets in some areas for cycling, and so we thought this would be a, a wonderful experiment. Uh, what we found is our trips were really short. Uh, they were in that sort of university region, so we didn't have a lot of options uh, for, for route choice. We'd love to understand how terrain matters, right? Uh, or speed limit on the road may matter, uh, infrastructure by mode. Baltimore will let us do some of that, and we're working towards that. Uh, Baltimore doesn't have a lot of terrain, so we're not going to be able to get that terrain issue from the Baltimore system. Birmingham, Alabama, where the other Bewegan system is, does have terrain. And so, and they've got a big, big kind of grid street network in their service area, so we may be able to get that go that direction if we wanted to. So that's another application. Put it on the list. Yeah. Yep. Anything else? Okay. It's a reminder for those who were just for the class. Uh, your journal for the class is due Tuesday, 5 p.m. Uh, and then uh, pl please submit those to detail. Uh, there should be a folder there that you can submit. Okay, uh, with that, uh, let's put it together. Thank you.